This is House Planning Help, episode 198. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self-build, because I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Coming up in this session, my guest is interior designer Emily Bisley. Yes, we're going to be talking interior design. This one's really all about creating an interior fit for the exterior. How do you do that exactly? Well, we'll be digging into that subject in a moment. I'm busy planning ahead for 2018. Yes, a new year approaches. 2017 has been a busy one for me. Hopefully it's been a good one for you too. I wanted to pose this question. What do you want from us? What exactly for next year? We're busy planning our podcasts and our videos and blogs and the rest of it. And a lot of ideas actually come out of the hub when I'm chatting to hub members and seeing what they're struggling with and think, can I help here? Maybe I can make something on this. I get a lot of ideas when I go to conferences, perhaps bump into interesting people, get told about interesting people or watch interesting presentations. And then my own project certainly brings up a few areas that I think I know nothing about this. It's time to change that. So back to you again, what topic would you like us to cover? Just drop me a line through the website houseplanninghelp.com forward slash contact. We'll put that in the show notes too. Or if you're on Twitter, maybe far easier just to tweet me at Ben Adam Smith. Let's get to our featured interview. I first met Emily Bisley when her self-build was nominated for a UK Passive House Award and I was down there doing some filming. And then a little while later, I wrote an article for Passive House Plus magazine on their home. And after that, she was top of mind when it came to thinking of interior designers. Who would I want to work with on my own self-built project? Now, unfortunately, the timing just didn't work. And also the distance, I think, was a slight issue too. So it wasn't going to happen, but I'm really pleased we stayed in touch. And we've made this happen, got to return to Dundon Passive House and to talk interiors. So let's get going. I started by asking Emily to tell me a little bit about her background. I always wanted to be an interior designer since I was very small. And I remember in my parents' house, I was always painting this and that and, you know, doing my bedroom a hundred times. And then I just went down a completely different route at university. I did French and psychology. Um, I'd done art foundation before that. So, and then I went to work in Paris. I just really thought I need to go back and do the thing I always wanted to do. So then I went to Chelsea Art College and did some more qualifications and then I went to work for architects to get some experience and then from there went to work for an interior designer in London and I've been doing that ever since. That's quite a good context for our discussion today because you are married to an architect, Graham, and in fact I've been here before, this is one of my favourite houses. However, the reason I wanted to chat to you was because this building has this great connection inside to outside the interior seems to feel like it belongs to the outside of the building and I think that's actually quite unusual I've seen lots of buildings sometimes the interior is a little bit of an afterthought so where do we begin on this story just with the house first of all well we we were both when we we lived in London and when we wanted to move back here which is actually I'm from Somerset so we had this sort of yearning to to head back to the countryside and have our children And we were, I think we'd been holidaying in Switzerland and places like that. And we just loved the timber houses and and just how they felt so snug and and just really something about a timber house in this sort of landscape just seemed right. So that was our starting point. And I think the point you make is really interesting about the inside and the outside marrying up. And we saw a lot of houses that look fabulous on the outside, like timber cladding has been all the rage for I don't know how long. And then you go inside and it's all sort of crashing disappointing because it's all white plasterboard with twinkly down lighters and absolutely no atmosphere. And it's almost like, what happened there? You know, I thought I was going into a wooden house. And I think, you know, if you look at those houses in places like Tyrol and Switzerland, you know, they are wooden inside and outside. They're made of wood. That's what they are. And I think in this country, particularly the sort of grand designs thing, people have this idea that everything is... It's all an option. So you think, well, I like the wood on the outside, but inside I want it to be more like this. And and people make those decisions, which is fine, but I don't think they necessarily make them in a very coherent way and with a bigger idea about what the building's supposed to be. And I think that's where we came from. It's a wooden building. So that was very early on in the process when you started to formulate a plan for what the house would look like. We need to talk about where we are too. So how did you find this piece of land? 
We'd just been looking in the auctions for a long time before we sold our house in London and then just realised actually that we can't buy anything because we kept seeing these fabulous places then just you have to sell before you buy. So so we did that and then once after we sold our house this was pretty much the first thing we saw and we went to the auction and we bought it. And was it a building or did it have planning permission on this site? It was an old um, timber bungalow from the 1920s. So it didn't have planning permission, but um, there's an, you know, if it's got a building on it, you can replace it. So we went down that route because we, I mean, it was, a, it was assumed we would get permission, which we did. And we got permission to enlarge, you know, the new house from what was there before. And also the original bungalow was timber. So it felt very right not to be replacing this quite light building with a, just a really trad stone thing or something and also we're away from the village so it didn't make sense either we're stuck out in a field so and you didn't come up against any planning constraints that someone said no you can't build something like that here sometimes they can get very descriptive about what they want no we didn't have that but then uh we've always had a very clear idea i think the planners don't like it if they think you're just following your own agenda too much and you haven't i mean i think replacing a timber house with a timber house in open countryside just seemed it seemed sensible. It was not like we were trying to build a six-storey tower or something. It was just we were trying to do something unassuming and that had connections with the other buildings around here, like barns and things. So we're not trying to make it look like a barn. I know that's quite a thing people do. Like, it's in the countryside, so it needs to look like a barn. We weren't doing that. We were just having a relationship to those things, being sympathetic to them. Maybe you can just explain a little bit about the site, some of the potential that you wanted to explore. Um, it's a very small site, so I think ideally we'd have had something bigger, but what we really liked was the location. So it's on the edge of a village, it's not in the village. I didn't want to be isolated. And it's got on a south southwest facing slope, so very sunny. And for Passive House, obviously, that's important. To, you know, you're wanting to really maximise your solar gain on the south side. So that was really good. And we have a shelter by the hill to the north side, so we're on a gently sloping site. And because the site's quite small, the house plan is very compact, which again is good for passive house. So those things sort of sort of designed itself in in that way. You know, it had to it had to pretty much be a. Well, square. you must have been looking for a site that had that south facing aspect yeah. that you could exploit. Were there any other eco responsibilities that you felt going into this, or was it just this is going to be a passive house and we'll work out everything else? I think the we didn't even set out at the very start to say that it's going to be a passive house. I think we always wanted a south-facing side. I'm just a bit obsessed with light and warmth and I suppose I'm a bit of a sun worshipper really. And also I grow a lot of vegetables and flowers. You know, that's really important to me, the aspect of the garden from that point of view. Yes, I mean, I don't think there was anything else eco about the site. It was just, you know, we don't have masses of room for ground source heat pumps and all that sort of thing. It's a very small site. But you were building timber frame. So you could say that that is a good approach anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the whole construction, you know, everything we've used in the construction has been, you know, hemp insulation and warm cell and, you know, see the solar and everything. Yeah, we've totally tried to make it as eco as we possibly could. So how did things progress then? Because you're obviously both coming from slightly different aspects. You've got Graham on the architecture side, you on the interior design. Did you meet OK in the middle? Yes, we did. I think we, we've got really similar ideas, actually. So it was fine. And we just, yeah, I think we, it was a really constructive sort of dialogue that we had. I mean, I, at the time, had a very small baby. So it was, a lot of it was me almost being client and saying, I oh, know I don't like that and I do like that and having a lot of discussions about it. And then Graham would sort of go away and change the drawings and then we'd look at it again. But we were both sort of sketching. We, we did a lot of sketching. OK, what does our kitchen want to feel like on a sunny morning? And we'd be sort of drawing all those things just, you know, just freehand, just just sort of imagining our lives, I suppose. And I think that, I mean, that's the way I always design anyway. I just start just, just drawing stuff, just drawing little room scenes. And to both of us, the atmosphere is really important. We're much more how do we want it to feel than how do we want it to look. That's definitely how we would design any room or house or whatever. And did you start on the inside? Was that how it was built? You get that sorted first and then work outwards? No, I think both totally going alongside each other. Interesting. Very much so. So how do you do that then, <laughs> doing both at once? And really pretty much like I was just saying, you're saying, how do I want my kitchen to feel? What do I want, what do I want to look at? 
while I'm having my breakfast, where's the sun coming in? And so you start drawing that and they say, how does that affect the elevation outside? If I have a really big window there because I'm wanting to look at the orchard. How does that look? Okay, so that doesn't sit very comfortably. Okay, what if we shift it just that way? How does, what does that feel like inside then? And you're constantly doing that inside, outside, inside, outside and pushing it around, pushing it around. Yeah, so it's, it was, you know, and, and we had the luxury because it was our house. We, the clock wasn't ticking on us. So we could do that as much as we wanted. Did it feel funny doing it for yourself? Because obviously you've had a lot of clients before this. Um, no, it was really exciting. It was great. Because I lived in a house for some years that Graham had designed before I met him. So I was did, always... he, did he do a good job? Well, he, it was, <laughs> you know, there were a lot of things I wouldn't have done. So this was like, OK, we're going to do this one together and we're going to get it right for work because he built a house for himself as a single young man so yeah this was a house for a family I mean the only unknown in that was you know while we were designing we didn't really know although we had this baby I mean you just don't know what it's like having small kids running around and you know so we were sort of having to guess a bit and friends sort of said to us oh no you wouldn't do that if you had young children or whatever so, so what would you have changed? Because there are certain aspects. I'll just think of a couple outside. You can step out and look at the view on the veranda. You'll tell me what the correct expression is. I like the way how we're sitting in a snug at the moment and you step down. That's an interesting thing because you could say, well, you just want it all flat. You get an opportunity to build it all flat. So what were some of these things you were trying to bring out? I think the thing with the the snug being on the separate Slight, well, like a little half level up. It was a sort of reaction to people at the time, for a long time, had been doing open plan living, kitchen, dining areas. And that was the sort of big, oh, hey, you just want everything open plan. You just want to. And actually, we just thought, actually, I don't know that you do. And I think it's really nice to have a, a sitting area, the snug room, where because you step up and also the seat, the, it follows the roof line, so the ceiling comes down, that it just makes it much cosier. And it's just a little bit of articulation. It just slightly separates the room from the kitchen. And then there's doors you can put across, but we don't tend to. And it was just, yes, giving, so giving the space a different atmosphere to the adjoining kitchen dining area by just doing something quite simple, quite a, quite a small move. The materials are the same. You know, it's not wildly different in that way, but it's... It's how you just slightly manipulate the space to to create a different atmosphere. And, and people said to us at the time, oh, oh, with little children, you don't want steps. And actually, steps are a fact of life, and they pretty soon get used to them. So, I mean, things like that, I would just... I mean, I know there's sort of access issues as well, but... What about internal glazing? Did that go down OK? Yeah, I mean, internal glazing was something we would always really liked from French houses. Um, and that was just something that was always in our in our sort of list of things we'd like. It just allows light to flow and it allows interesting relationships between spaces. It's not a series of boxes with doors. It's, you know, you can, for example, the glazing in the office, it means that you get the sunset in high summer coming straight through to the kitchen because it sets over there. Yeah, just and it just, just makes things a bit more interesting, really. And you're very hands-on. So at what stage did you start doing things and tinkering on site? Was it from the beginning? I mean, maybe first we should talk about what structure this is underneath us. You talked about timber frame, but I imagine there's going to be some foundations first. Yes. Yeah, so it's um, there was a concrete slab underneath and retaining wall. So we dug down a bit, but it's... Um, was that pricey? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's all, it, well, it always is. But we we did it because we didn't want to, to make the house unduly high. We wanted it to just to sit back in the hillside. So it's not really any taller than the original bungalow, but we've got two floors. You know, a developer house would just be plonked on some stilts at the front and, and um, to make the site flat. But then you lose the relationship to the garden, whereas we very much sort of sit down into the garden on the lower floor. Yeah, so there's a concrete slab and then the, the timber frame was built off that. And then you got involved after that stage when it you had a structure to play around yeah, with? Yeah, I mean, Graham, was in, uh, Graham managed the whole thing, so he was involved every single day. Um, and, you know, and he was sort of contracts manager, so he ordered everything. And so, yeah, he was full-time doing that for about a year. Um, and I kind of helped when I could, mainly after it had we got to the stage of putting in sort of things like the hemp insulation I did a lot of that and then later on plath I did lots of well we use this um firmicell which you then use a kind of plaster for finishing it so I did all of that then after we'd moved in lots of decorating and then lots of moving on to design bits of furniture and 
I don't feel I've discovered how you've got this great interior. I know we talked a little bit about it. Did you devise mood boards in those early days? Where did this fit into all the things that happened on site? While we were designing the house, we had this folder where we just collated, we just put anything that we really liked, images that we'd collected Both for years. Both of you, because I've us. had this where perhaps it's not 50-50. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I suspect it was mostly me, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty, I like it. Yeah, but we were very much liking the same things. And we've still got that and we really like looking at it because you can see all sorts of sort of ideas definitely flow through to what we've got now. But um, yeah, and then there, there are two quite distinct atmospheres, overall sort of atmospheres in the house. One is the rooms that are lined with oak and one is the rooms that are lined with plywood and then they're painted. So no wall is just a plastered wall. It's either got plywood and painted or it's oak. And that was sort of quite a conscious decision because we just decided actually if all the bedrooms are full of oak I mean we're not in a ski chalet I think you want a little bit of I don't know calmness and lightness in the bedroom so so we did that so that was but you know there aren't too many there aren't too many ideas in the interior I think that's really fundamental there are a few ideas and they're carried through with some rigor they're not oh and actually no I really like to have a red whatever and oh I've always wanted one of these it wasn't like that at all we were quite sort of disciplined in, in restricting the palette and not getting not trying to make it, oh, and I've always wanted, you know, just a, a mishmash of everything you've always quite liked. And definitely not a mishmash of a load of shopping, which I think is the other thing people do with interiors. It's all about product. And actually, we've got a few things we really like that we've perhaps spent some money on, but not very many. That lamp, I can think of as an example. You know, that was, that was like, I really want one of those. But, you know, that's not, that's not really the way it was. It so the furniture at that early stage did you have an idea of what it was or was it just i know what this room's going to look like and then that will come further down the line because by the time you've finished a house i can see money will be short and if you haven't budgeted well or you haven't got everything ready to go (laughs) that's when you end up with all your old furniture Mm -hmm. yeah and i don't think there's anything wrong with that we took a long time finishing the house and it's a luxury because you can't do that with the client because they want to move in and they want everything there. But your interior will definitely benefit from the longer you can let ideas. And, then, and, you know, and then you put something in and then you react to that and think, actually, what it really needs now is this. And I think all good decorators, as they're called, you know, people who put the rooms together in a much more sort of things sort of way. I mean, I think they're all really good at doing that, at just look at putting something looking at it thinking about it and you know it's good to have an overall idea but you also need to be able to respond and build things in a more organic way i think and there are things that can't be done that way for example electrics i just i had a a brief look up while you were speaking there to think is there a light in the middle of the room of course there's not a light in the (laughs) middle of the room but that does mean that you've got your one light that's plugged in in the corner there and another one that's hanging from the ceiling Uh, interestingly close to the window why is it close to the window or is it just because at night time, I suppose, that window's just not going to have any light coming through it? Yeah, it's just relating. I mean, yeah, electrics is one of the things that you absolutely have to, yes, you have to be able to pretty much know what you're going to do. So I, I would, yes, that's maybe I'm being slightly misleading. When you do your plans, you do furniture plans and you do your electrical plans. And you have to, I mean, and maybe things change slightly down the line and you might move something, but you pretty much need to know, OK, sofa's going to go there. And as to what those things are, you might not yet know, but you definitely need to say... Yes, and lighting, I always think, needs to relate to furniture. So that lamp is there because if you're sitting in this corner and you're reading, you want a light. And it doesn't bother me that it's near the window. I think that's, that's fine. It's a great big window, you know. And like you say, yes, you, you would only have the lamp on in the evening. Do you ever open that window? And do you know what the dimensions are? Looks like about a metre and a half square. I'm just thinking from my my house. I'm wondering some of the windows. Will I ever open that? Do you open this one? No, we don't no. tend to. Well, that's because, what I'm wondering. Yeah. Um, because you, you know, with passive house, you don't need to. And because this is an evening room, and in some of the rooms that we're in, a lot in the daytime in the summer, yes, you just open everything up. But we in the summer, we're not really in here. So, are there windows that you might open for a little bit of summer ventilation? You've got bifold am i right in saying yeah. out so that just takes you straight on, out onto that mm. balcony area but do you have a little repertoire of these windows might be open more often or doors or kitchen the kitchen and dining area in the summer i'll open the door and the big folding sliding doors you know on a nice day that's all open and then you know if it's very warm then there's sort of cross ventilation maybe put some of the windows on the north side on trickle vent and then there's the big 
roof light over the stair. So those those are the ones we use mostly for ventilation. You've got a flipped layout as well, which is something I always like, particularly when you drive in on the top level. So it's not as if mm. you're lugging all the stuff up to the kitchen because you're yeah. on the level of the kitchen. Was that quite purposeful with the site as well, thinking, uh, or did you want an upside down house? We That was probably the biggest decision that we made really early on was, you know, which way round are we going to do it? And a lot of friends were like, well, no, because I think you just want to walk straight out of your kitchen and into the garden. But we were like, yes, but then you'd have to come through your front door and go downstairs. And, you know, so we did um and ah about that a lot. And But for us, we've definitely done it the right way around. And what we took a quite a lot of care over there for is that, you know, the connect you can get out to the garden in various different places. And you can even go out on the upper floor to the garden on the same level. If you see what I mean. Yeah, well, you see the way the circulation works. It, yes. So we didn't want that feeling of being on the upper floor and feeling really disconnected from the garden. That was the only concern that we had. What else have we not mentioned? Are there other things that you've made and do they all have to be out of the same wood, your oak upstairs and it's like different downstairs? I don't think we've made any furniture out of wood, out of the oak. I think the oak is very much, you know, the house and then things that we've put in it. What about the kitchen then? Because oh, that's yes. quite yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's quite bespoke and it looks fantastic. But is that something you crafted? Yes. So well, not yeah. I and mean, we had a, a really good joiner in Langport who made our kitchen, and the idea was that it just followed on from the oak lining of the walls. It just flows right across the kitchen, and he used exactly the same. He got the wood from the same supplier and things so that it would completely tie in. Yeah, and the uh, yeah. So the kitchen is intended to look like the walls. And blend in and are you checking out that it's fsc certified all yeah. of those those things are important Absolutely, that's interesting yeah, you, you yeah. gave me the of course I, I did. <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. what else do we need to mention then particularly going back to what i was saying at the beginning about this interior exterior just working so well any tips you could give someone coming to build a house and wanting to do this are you going to tell me we have to hire an interior designer <laughs> No, I think I think just have some clear ideas and follow them through and don't get distracted. And just try and think about the atmosphere. For example, in this room, it doesn't have a smooth white ceiling. It has a very textured, is this rough sawn softwood buttons, which are nailed up there and then painted with rather badly by me. But I quite like that they're painted rather badly. You know, it's texture and um, it just it gives an atmosphere. And then what's this by the stove that you have down here? You've got some tiles and it looks like there's, is it concrete? Slab? Yeah, so that's an in situ concrete hearth, which a friend of a friend did for us. We looked at various ways of doing that and just decided actually it was going to be much better in situ because then we don't have any joints. And then um, those really, it basically, this thing, the idea is that it's like an old ingle nook, you know, like black. You sort of look at it, has got like a big black hole. You can see the, the tiles are so shiny. You also get a lot of reflections from the windows. So... They're a really dark aubergine brown colour. They're Moroccan, very finely joined to so see. You don't see much grout. Um, yeah, it's like a modern day ingle nook is the idea. Now, I'm just wondering, I haven't ever done this in a podcast before, but I just have a feeling that we should walk around, maybe just in case we suddenly spot anything that we should have talked about. Okay. Does that sound right? Just to yeah. finish off the podcast, if you yeah. feel any inspiration to tell me anything along the way. So we've mentioned the, the kitchen, the stainless steel unit there. Yeah. So, um, well, this, that was, well, three different local craftsmen. One built the frame, one did the worktop, and then the joiner did all the cabinets that suspended underneath it. What do you find when you're cooking? Because this is how we're going to have our hob on a unit like this. You haven't got any ventilation, have you, right by the stove? No, the MVHR extract is up there in that cupboard. So, uh, essentially, that's constantly extracting and that, that's pretty good. That works really well. I must say we barbecue a lot outside on the deck. We've got a gas barbecue. So anything really frying or, you know, char grilling, we do all that outside. So the combination of that, because it's literally just outside that door, we don't tend to do very greasy, smelly cooking in the kitchen. It's, that's quite a conscious decision because we don't have some big extract hanging over the whole... I have to remember that because <laughs> I do lots of smelly cooking. <laughs> what about the length of this balcony? It, I'm, I've... I'm sure I've got that name wrong. What do you call this section outside? Yeah, deck, veranda. Okay, yeah. you do. 
were you looking for a very specific thickness so that you can have your table and chairs out yeah. there? And-, and we didn't, it's sort of the house is not a, it's not rectilinear, it's not like a square box. So, and that's quite intentional. It's, it's pretty much square in plan, but it has that wall slopes out. So that meant that that corner of the deck gets wider so that, for the table and chairs. And that's quite intentional because we didn't, we couldn't afford to have a really deep one because I mean, in terms of space, because, you know, the site boundary is just down there. So all those little tiny manipulations of things are actually really important, you know, that that wall slopes, so that gives you that space. And then it cuts back in there. And so, yes, every little bit is really I've noticed that you don't seem to have much hanging on the wall here. For example, I'm looking at a mirror that's propped against the wall mm. and you have got one painting i think it is am i right yeah. <laughs> over there but everything else it's a lot about the furniture and what's on top yes i suppose we didn't want to uh, it's slightly tricky hanging a lot of things on the oak walls because we really like the oak so and I'm, I'm quite keen on just yes putting things. you can have a sort of changing tableau going on you know when you're putting things on top of furniture okay should we just walk past the office see so we talked about the glazing didn't we the staircase now we're looking at were well, you always going to have skylights there because you do have the overheating issue sometimes with passive house but i guess we're on the north side on of the, the house north now side. and it's very good for a you know, sort of chimney effect here just drawing warm air up if it does get hot we just open that because that's openable and it was really important to us to have this light going basically that's the darkest bit of house you know this is really the center of the plan down there but it gets this light right into the middle so you don't have any sort of dark dingy corners everywhere it's got light from all which sides. you can do on an earth sheltered type dig into the the hill mm. yeah, on that bottom level let's yeah. just have a wander down and then you've just got the three bedrooms yeah. down here i mean this space is really important to us so this is the hallway you know i think in other houses people might say oh but all that wasted space that could have gone into the bedrooms or whatever but we were really keen that this wasn't just you come down and it's a bit of a rabbit war in a bedroom and that's it. This space onto the garden, which relates to the garden and we go out in and out that door, that's really important. And it also, the idea is this is quite flexible. I did have my office here for a bit, but I don't anymore. You know, maybe the kids will take this over for homework or, you know, it's just nice to have a space that's not, um, you know, can just change over the years, really, with what you need. To what about storage then? Have you been careful as to where certain things have been tucked away were you conscious as you designed the house yeah we've got a lot of storage and we're still quite messy um (laughs) but if we did decide to put everything away there would be a space for everything i'm much messier than my husband but um yeah so the kids have got really big wardrobes we've got loads of wardrobes in our dressing room and this is all storage for this area and then we've got a big store which is in the bit that's basically built into the bank quite dark at the back there that's as you know, plant room, storeroom, utility. So that quite deals with that in a bit of the house where, you know, you're not really going to use it for anything else. And how many square metres floor area do we have in the whole house? 240, I think. 240, OK. Well, I really enjoyed our chat today. Is there a, a final thought that you'd like to finish on? I, I sense that you would do something like this again. Would I be right? <laughs> yes. I don't know that we could afford to do it again. I think this was our... Anyway, we'll see. But yes, no, I would do it again. It was Because you always have more ideas and more things you'd like to do. Yeah. But have you achieved everything that you wanted to with this or... Definitely. Yes. I think the only thing is for me, I just love growing things. I love the garden and actually that could, you know, I run out of space. I've got chickens, I've got no more room to plant trees. And so, yeah, for me, a move would be about the garden rather than about the house. Do you grow any of your own vegetables or is this all about flowers for you and both. different? Yeah, both. Lots of grow, lots of vegetables. And I love the fruit trees. I'm a, I'm really mad keen cook. So, yeah, gardens. Super important. And I love flowers. I grow lots of flowers. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, lovely to catch up with you again. Thank you. Thank you. Head online to take a look at the show notes that accompany today's session at houseplanninghelp.com slash 198 where you can review all the main information once again. Also check out some photos of the interior of Dundon Passive House, probably the exterior too, and we'll embed that video from the UK Passive House Awards a couple of years back. Go and have a look at that. I'll give you a sense of the place after listening to this. If you've got a comment or you'd like to ask a question, scroll down to the bottom. That's where you can do it. We'll link you across to Emily Bisley Interior Design. 
all at houseplanninghelp.com slash 198. Finally, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, then I'd really encourage you to write an honest review in iTunes or whatever directory you use. As these good folk have done, this is from McVixen. The title is Fantastic Resource for Self-Builders with a Conscience. Starting out on my journey of discovery about sustainable building, I came across this podcast by chance. It's a brilliant resource and has introduced me to all kinds of other resources, as well as providing a solid base of understanding about the whole subject of environmentally aware self-building. With a mixture of interviews, case studies and Ben and his family's personal project, it makes what could be a very dry subject interesting and engaging. It also makes my two-hour commute feel productive. Two hours? Oh my goodness. Well, you're going half the country. Can't rate it or recommend it highly enough. Thank you very much, McVixen. Also, this is Truly Jay. Well worth a listen if you're interested in creating a home, whether it be passive house or renovation. There's loads to be learned from Ben and his guests. Thank you. So, yes, if you haven't written us a review already, jump into your podcast directory. iTunes is still probably the biggest one out there and you just need to go into the store and find our podcast and you can write a review from there a positive review bumps us up in the rankings just informs others of what this is all about and maybe they'll click it and download it and that's as far as we go for today thanks for tagging along i'll see you next time the house planning help podcast is produced by regen media content that matters <laughs>